It is 5.04 p.m. on Monday, January 16, 2023. Uh, the Board of Commissioners of the Hardwick Electric Department is meeting. All commissioners are present, as is Mike Sullivan, Beth, Beth Essery, Brooke Dingledean, and Julia Leopold uh, from EPSA, and Sarah Bress Bre How do you pronounce your last name, Sarah? Grace. Oh, I'm sorry? Braze. Braze. And I apologize. My camera's having issues this morning or this uh, evening. So okay. no, no worries. No worries. Um, okay. Um, the agenda has been circulated. And um, are there any modifications to the agenda? <laughs> yes. I'd like to add an item about um, the joint meeting with the select board that's been kind of back burnered. We could just talk about that briefly, that would be great. Okay, where where do you wanna put that? You wanna put that with other at the time of other business? Yes. Okay. Any objection? Nope. Okay. Hearing none, okay. So we have some prior minutes. Um, we have the minutes from uh, the special meeting on August 22nd. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Second. All in, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. That was everyone is in favor. So the minutes are approved from August 22nd. And then we have uh, minutes from the meeting of uh, December 19th. Is there a motion to approve? I move to approve. Is there second. a second? Okay. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Uh, there's no opposition. The minutes are approved, which takes us to the next um, item on the agenda, which is a regulatory <coughs> legislative update. Um, Julia and Sarah, I think the floor is. Yeah, yours. Julia's on first. And I don't know that all of you have met Julia. Uh, but I'll let her run her gambit. And she did give us fair warning that she's got a five-year-old running around. So be aware. Yeah, five-year-old and um, the five-year-old's grandmother are running around. So <laughs> <laughs> a little extra noisy. Was chasing um, home. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so thank you for having me today. I appreciate it. This is my first time at uh -huh. a Hardwick Commissioner's meeting. I've met a few of you before, so it's good to see you again and um, good to meet those of you that I haven't met in person. So we can uh, kick this off with the legislative update. Um, and this is this is basically the update that I provided to the board of directors, I think it was last week or two weeks ago at this point. But uh, basically, we're starting off a new biennium. It kicked off the first Wednesday of the year. And um, there are several updates that we are going to expect to see that are energy related over the course of this session. Um, there are a few uh, bills that are already um, under consideration by committee. Um, so Mike had sent out the memo that I included. Um, so the first is, is the clean heat standard. Uh, you may recall this from last year. So the clean heat standard basically is um, a concept that uh, allows fuel dealers to become regulated. So right now in the state of Vermont, obviously electric utilities are regulated, but different types of fuel dealers for oil, for <laughs> propane are not regulated. Um, but heating of our homes and buildings is the second largest cause for greenhouse gas emissions in our state. So when we, the electric utilities, look at you know our, um, our climate requirements that we have under the Global Warming Solutions Act and how to meet those targets, 
generally speaking, electric utilities are in really good shape. Um, Vermont utilities are only um, accounting for about 2% of Vermont greenhouse gas emissions, but transportation and heating of our homes and buildings is an area where we have a lot of progress to make. So the clean heat standard is um, a piece of legislation that attempts to regulate fuel dealers and um, create a system where they can, you know, install things like heat pumps um, in addition to their to their regular business, and then claim savings for those heat pumps. And they can also kind of buy and sell and trade those credits. Um, so it's a really interesting concept. Um, from the utility perspective, we generally are okay with it because uh, it takes the pressure off of the electric rate payer. Basically, you're not you're not trying to create a funding mechanism from electric rate payers, which is an option that the legislature really likes to lean on because we're regulated entities. Um, but by by moving forward with this clean heat standard or how it's been rebranded uh, this session as the Affordable Heat Act, um, you're creating <laughs> regulation among the fuel dealers. So they would basically, it's, it's kind of like cost causer pays. The folks who are using the fossil fuels will be responsible for paying to reduce the use of fossil fuels. So this last year, um, this went through the legislature. Uh, it passed the legislature. It made it onto the governor's desk. It was vetoed by our governor. Um, and then it made it back to the legislature and it failed to override the veto by one vote. So this year, it's a very different legislature. We have a supermajority of Democrats. Um, so the Clean Heat uh, Standard, now the Affordable Heat Act, it is being revived. Um, it's out there as Bill S.5 um, under consideration under Senate Natural Resources. Um, we do fully expect this to move forward. And then the devil is going to be in the details on the interaction between this act and tier three of the renewable energy standard, um, which you all, I believe, are familiar with. Um, that's the portion of the renewable energy standard that requires utilities to incentivize fossil fuel reductions. So since there is some play between those two different pieces of legislation, um, we'll need to work out, you know, under the PUC rules, what this actually looks like, what savings we can claim. So a lot more to come on this one. Any questions on Affordable uh, Heat Act before we move on? Okay. Um, so the next item on the agenda uh, is 100% renewable energy standard. Um, so I will say there is no bill under consideration right now. There has not been um, statute that has been drafted or introduced. Um, we expect that that could happen later on this session. Basically, for the past several months, Renewable Energy Vermont, which is a trade association for renewable uh, developers here in the state, um, has been pushing for new statute that changes the renewable energy standard. So the current renewable energy standard requires that electric utilities must be 75% renewable by 2032. That amount increases over time. So right now we're around roughly 60% renewable. And then of that portion of renewability, a certain amount has to come from small in-state new generators, which essentially just translates to solar. So Renewable Energy Vermont, of course, is representing the solar developers, and they are pushing for an increase of that in-state new uh, component. So we want to see, they want to see that grow from 10% up to 20%. Generally speaking, the utilities are not on board with that concept. Um, we're, I would say, by and large supportive of getting to 100% renewable, but the more prescript prescriptive the legislature becomes, the more likely it is that we will see cost pressures, um, generally because of net metering. So right now, our plan with the Renewable Energy Standard, given that this is a new legislature, we've got a lot of new faces here, um, and given that the Department of Public Service is currently conducting a robust stakeholder outreach um, around the Renewable Energy Standard and other electric um, renewable policies, our move is to kind of watch and see what REV is going to do. If REV chooses to put legislation 
out um, in committee and have it sponsored, then um, we have some ready to go legislation that could kind of counter that. But we're also being really mindful of the fact that we're encouraging people to participate in this Department of Public Service stakeholder engagement. Ideally, we don't want to be encouraging legislators to move forward anything about the renewable energy standard until that report from the department has been submitted to the legislature. We basically don't want to put the cart before the horse. So I think we're going to, um, at first, be slightly reactive to REV, and then from there, if we need to, we can start to move on the offense. Um, I will say that something that we're also considering, and I can talk more about this um, a little bit later in the more communication side update, um, is just really promoting about all of the wonderful things that we are doing with the res. Um, so for example, Hardwick has had some really great projects in the past few years. You've helped um, different agricultural businesses get off of a diesel generator and onto electricity. And that's a fantastic thing. You're reducing carbon you're meeting your compliance for renewable energy standard, um, you're helping a local business. So there are a lot of really great stories out there like that one um, that we'll be promoting and ideally just help the legislators understand that the statute that they, that they have in place already is working, it is working well, um, and that the area of focus for greenhouse gas emissions reduction should really be on the transportation and the thermal sectors. There's a lot. <laughs> Do we have any questions here? <laughs> Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> Go ahead, Lynn. Yeah. Or Chair Gedanken, I should say. No, you can say Lynn. That's just fine. <laughs> we're, we're not formal. Um, is there any, and I don't know if it's as part of the, the, the res discussion or something else, um, any um, effort to get nukes considered as renewable? I mean, it strikes me that one possible trade off is to let the um, small in-state piece come up somewhat, you know, but count nukes as um, as renewable. Yeah, so I don't think that nuclear would ever be under consideration for renewable, but um, it is possible, you know, as the renewable energy standard gets open up, um, there might be consideration about, you know, what do we care about more? Um, we've already determined under the Global Warming Solutions Act that we care about carbon reductions um, because those are the targets that we need to hit. And renewability and carbon free are not always, you know, necessarily interchangeable. And nuclear is a great example of that. It's not renewable, but it is carbon free. Um, so I think it's something that could be under consideration, but I don't necessarily think it's going to divert people's eyes away from that local in-state component. Um, there are a lot of folks in Vermont that really love that idea and think that we need to be independent and generating all of our own energy right here in the state. Obviously, when you run a utility, um, you know that that does not work. So, and, and if it does work, it's working at a very high cost. Um, so I think that Nuclear is something that could come under consideration. It's certainly possible, um, but it's not going to to sway people away from expanding tier two of the res. But if 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 we're moving towards a hundred percent renewable and nuke is not, in other words, that we have to be that everything that we get is renewable, and nukes aren't, then they're out of the picture. Yeah, and, I should. And that's and, and, and that's, is, that's a high yeah. cost, and it's destable. I mean, we can go on a long list of 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 the problems with moving that way. So, how do we get nukes into the picture of 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 the of the long range plan, if you will? Yeah. So, I think um, when when we comply with the renewable energy standard, it's it's basically. Um, we're looking at what are the recs that we have bought and sold, and we're we're basically retiring recs. So we can still have nuclear in our pre buying and selling, um, you know, rec purchases, uh, power supply portfolio. So nuclear can still be part of our our energy strategy and our power supply strategy going forward. But when it comes to res compliance, we'll need to be able to retire enough recs to meet. Uh, the certain portion of our retail sales. You're saying the res is separate from from the notion of being 100% renewable. So the res, um, our res compliance and the recs that we buy and sell are not 
married to the energy that we're buying and selling. So we have some instances where we're buying energy okay. from a renewable generator and we're, we're buying the energy and we're buying the recs, but we also have the ability to buy the energy from a generator and not buy recs that are associated with it. And that conversation is something that could come up. So if they open up the res and say, we um, right now our recs are decoupled from the energy, we might want to marry them. That would be a big change for nuclear. With, with the- uh... But, you, but, but you're, just let me finish on the nukes. So you're, you're presupposing that nukes are just not going to fly with the legislature, that there's no way to educate people about that, even though nationally that is in fact what's happening. It would be it would be a, a heavy lift here in Vermont, um, but no, I, I mean I agree with you completely that nuclear is a, an important part of reaching a carbon free um, electric power supply. Um, whether or not we can get the legislature on board with that, I think that would be a very difficult lift at this point. Um, I'm not saying it can't happen, but we can I think certainly consider it for our strategy, especially considering that you know, we've got a great opportunity here. We've got brand new legislators who, as of right now, are not jaded and they're a little more open-minded. Um, so we can use this as an opportunity to explain to them that nuclear um, is an important component of our power supply portfolios. Vince, you had a question? Yeah, to, to follow up on what you were saying, Lynn, I mean, uh, with the goal of 100% renewable, nukes get eliminated uh, as baseload. And the, the whole idea of it being 100% renewable without having any specific, not prescriptive, but specific idea of, of how these intermittent resources are going to be able to cover uh, load is just, I mean, it, it's not realistic, you know, unless you have a lot of hydro and hydro has its own issues and hydro isn't guaranteed either. So, I mean, the 100% renewable without having some kind of reasonable idea of what you're going to have for baseload capacity is just, I mean, it's just, it's ideology. It's not. Yeah, well, we're not, not yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not trying to convince anybody here. <laughs> we're just yeah, trying to I'm thinking out loud. Yeah. And it, it yeah. is worth noting that again, um, when we when we comply with the renewable energy standard, it is our post rec, you know, buying and selling rec transactions um, that we're focusing on for res compliance. Everything that is a pre rec transaction, so anything that makes up, you know, the power supply portfolio that this commission decides upon, um, you know, and, and passes that along to Sean Enderline and our our power supply team here at FEPSA. Um, that is separate. So we kind of look at like the before and the after. So the before, that is the power supply mix that you are all determining. There could be nuclear in there. There's your local hydro in there. And then you go through your rec transactions and you're basically buying and retiring enough recs to meet your compliance. And that can be separate from your power supply portfolio because the recs are decoupled from the energy. Matt, you had a question? Uh, uh, Julia, you said that by 2032, uh, we must be 75% renewable. Is that an average of the utilities or every utility in the state? That So that's a really good question. So VEPSA member utilities will comply in aggregate. So basically, we're managing compliance of the renewable energy standard on all of our members' behalf. So when we, we look at, you know, we being VEPSA, we being VEPSA, we being VEPSA. So the yeah, team at VEPSA will, will basically um, look at all of the VEPSA member utilities as one large utility, and we will buy and retire enough RECs. Um, so, you know, say it's 2032, we need to be 75% renewable. We're buying and we're retire, retiring enough RECs. Um, to meet 75% of retail sales as if all 11 member utilities were one utility. So we comply in aggregate. And, and what is Hardwick Electric right now alone, renewable? Oh um, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can, I can actually, I might have it pulled up. Give me one moment. I can share my screen. It won't be pretty, but I can show you. I'm just looking for a number. Here we go. Let's see if I can share. Oh, it says host disabled participant screen sharing.
Good now. So on your screen. And if you have questions about this, yeah, um, I would definitely refer you to our power supply team. But basically, I'm going to try to make this a little bigger for you. That's good. So this is your, your pre-rec transaction. So this is your power supply portfolio. So you've got nuclear as your, your big chunk right here. You've got landfill gas that's, system. That's last, last, that's last year or something. This is 2021. Yeah, this is 2021. <laughs> and the reason yeah. that we look at 2021 is because- well, that's irrelevant most... now. Well, yes and no. Um, it's in this moment, yes, your, your customers are receiving something slightly different. But the reason that we focus on 2021 is because we only feel comfortable sharing what has been approved by the Public Utility Commission. So this has recently received PUC approval. I think it was just three weeks ago that they approved the 2021. So we are always looking a little bit into the past, um, but this is basically yeah, what so we're the, saying. The point, the point there, Julia, is the, the res, the recs do all their shuffling once a year now. Yeah. So although we're in 2023 now, the recs for 2022 haven't been shuffled yet. So this is, it isn't as old as it looks is my point. Yeah, this is basically just received um, regulatory blessings. So We're always a year behind on recs. Always. So this is your pre-rec transactions and you see it's a you know, pretty colorful pie chart here. You've got um, quite a bit of mix. And then when I go to res compliance, and again, this is where we're complying in aggregate. So it is this pie chart here on the bottom. And what you're looking at here <laughs> is a lot of hydro. So we're we're basically we're buying hydro wrecks from Canada, from across the Northeast. And we're doing that because hydro wrecks are inexpensive. So by buying inexpensive wrecks, we're we're basically um, doing what we can to mitigate cost pressures to your customers by, you know, selling wrecks that are a little bit more valuable and buying back ones that are less expensive. So hydro tends to be less expensive. So we're buying those wrecks. There's our two percent of solar. That's the in-state requirement I was telling you about. And then you have your 35% non-renewable, that is largely nuclear um, and a little bit of system mix. So however much um, you have, whatever that gap is um, where you know you need to rely on the ISO market, um, that is in that non-renewable portion. So that is that's your res compliance, which you can see looks very different from your pre-rec transaction power supply mix. But, but uh, Julia, we have, I think we have the, we get the recs from H11, right, Mike? Yes. Yeah. So, so we're, we're more than 2%, aren't we? We so will be good. in the coming, all the recs that were generated in, the, in 2022 will come to us this, this year, like in the first quarter year sometime, but they're not in our picture until the state approves them. Right, but this is an aggregate, and I think Nat's question, and and mine as well, is is where does HED stand in all of this? Because we're not doing. Yeah, we'd have to do some some data mining. Um, if you if you're interested in that, I can put. Well, our I guess the question is, are we subsidizing or are we being subsidized? No, I mean by no. other VEPSA members. I think that's important for us to know. Neither. You're you are paying in what you need to get. So and I'll stop sharing because I think it'd be helpful to see faces at this point. Um, um stop share. Let's see if that works. Okay. So the way, and again, there are other folks at VEPSA who can speak much more eloquently um, about this topic than I can, but the way that our budgeting works for res is that you, especially for tier three, you pay in what you need. Um, so we're basically, you know, we're tracking everything on the back end, even though regulatory compliance is going in and aggregate, we are monitoring it on our side to ensure that there is no cross subsidization that's occurring. Um, right. So the, the, the members, Lynn, who are um, kind of in the equation are in are vastly in the same agreements that we are. 
Those who aren't would be, for example, Swanton Village has a massive hydro facility where they generate as much and more power than they could ever use in a year. So they don't have a lot of our other portfolio stuff, but they have the hydro. So they're they're a hundred percent renewable, I think anyway, or close to it, Julia, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, but those of us who are uh, <laughs> making up the quote unquote aggregate, we're all in the same agreements. So well, we're in the same agreements, but not this, not to the same extent. Um, understood. I, I just yeah, mean, there's no got, drastic got, we'll difference get... between us. It, it, if I, I could, that's, that's oh. fine. I, I don't think we have to have more discussion now. But I, I'm getting the sense that Nat would like to see, I would certainly like to see where we are. Um, and, and if that's relative to, to the other VEPSA members, that's fine. But I think we'd like to see where we are as a standalone. That, and that's absolutely possible. And uh, each utility is goes through its own unique individual power budgeting based on where they are at every, at you know, year end in compliance and that is how the power budget is designed and developed for the following year to ensure compliance okay so the last discuss I, I will get the follow-up on this for all of you but the last discussion i had um with sean about our renewability um the discussion was before the wind contract that we didn't get and then we got a subsequent wind contract and with those contracts came uh, tier one recs, which we were lacking. And once those start flowing, which is this year, uh, we were on track for, I believe, the next three years to be fully compliant in every tier. Um, so we are perfectly on track to hit those requirements of the res. But I'll get you more detail than that. That's the okay. general answer at this point. We're on track. Okay. Res compliance is really complex, um, so I appreciate these questions. And yeah. I think going forward, um, something that Sarah and I have talked about in the past is um, putting together like an educational program, not just for our board of directors who kind of hear about this every month, but you know something that can be a little bit more far reaching towards utility staff and commissioners and trustees. So if that's something you all are interested in, um, we'd be happy to do a deeper dive on res. Uh, I just have a couple more questions about res and I've actually sent in a couple comments from the, the, the res review RFI, but in any case, does VEPS have an opinion on, or uh, if so, uh, what is the opinion about including like demand response as a, being able to satisfy the res requirements or dispatchable storage? I mean, these all contribute to the intent, you know, the, uh, the intent of of the res in the first place, you know, or, or distribution upgrades, efficiency upgrades, those kind of things. Sure. Yeah. So our our position um, is that when it comes to load management or demand response, um, we're not looking to put that into the res. Um, the the res rules as they stand right now um, basically require that utilities need to be providing uh, best practices to customers who are increasing their load. Um, so between that and between the EV rates that are mandated for 2024, um, we think that we're in an okay position um, to continue moving forward with tier three and not necessarily having to do um, residential demand response. I know, you know, there are some other utilities, Green Mountain Power, VEC, that are doing the in-home power walls. Um, what we have found is that that is not an economical solution for the utilities that we serve, or in many cases for the customers that our utilities serve. Um, so it's not something that we're going to be pushing for because we don't think it's financially sound. However, we are exploring large scale uh, battery storage. We have a grant in right now um, that we have that we have applied for where we're trying to get funding to make that more economical. So while we recognize that load control is incredibly important, um, the approach that we want to take has to be economically sound. Okay, yeah, I mean, that answers part of it, but making the decision for the customer about whether or not, what, what their motivation should be about storage is, is really, I don't think that's the place of, 
Well, okay, Vince, oh, Vince, let's not get into a whole storage discussion right now. We've spent a lot of time on it and that's not today's agenda. We've got, we've just got a lot of stuff going yeah, on. Yeah, that's, that's fine, yeah. You, you said you sent in comments. You sent in comments to whom? To, uh, I think it's the DPS or is it the PUC? You, you would know better, uh, Julia. There's an RFI uh, that was, that closed in November, I think. And now there's a, there's a new engagement. In fact, I can send the links for, um, for comments. Okay, in, Vince, uh, Vince, you sent these comments in and you, uh, without go, going through the board? I don't need to go through the board for a personal comment. You're a member no, of this no, I'm board. No, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not doing it as a representative of the board. I'm making my own, my own analysis and comment. We, we, can, we can talk about having a board opinion on, on this uh, stuff. Yeah, okay, Let, let's, 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 let's not go there. Has the, has the deadline closed for those comments, Julia? So the Department of Public Service still has ongoing stakeholder engagement. Um, I believe what Vince is referring to is the stakeholder engagement process for the Renewable Energy Standard. It's also considering um, net metering policy and standard offer. So basically looking at all of the different renewable electric policies and determining what makes sense going forward. Because we've got all these little piecemeal approaches there's probably a better way. And that's what the Department of Public Service is trying to what find. What would be really important for us is to hear that there are these opportunities to comment sure. uh, in advance of the deadline so that we can decide if we want to and what, and if so, what we wanna say um, as a board. Um, and uh, so if, if uh, VEPSA could keep us apprised of that, that would be very helpful. Yeah, there's a, a series of webinars that's coming up so we can share those out. I think actually Sarah might have sent them out to our board of directors um, earlier today. Well, Mike, then week. if you're getting those, let us let us know. Um, I, I can forward them. I have the I have the email of, yeah. for those three webinars. <clears throat> Julia, it would be helpful to me uh, when you send those emails because you send a lot of emails. Sure do. Just send me, hey, your board's going to want this. So I, I yeah. know that's what I need to work on. Sounds good. You said these <laughs> are webinars. So webinar ordinarily, is there going to be an opportunity for audience comment is in the webinars? There will, yeah. And I believe the final webinar, they're calling it like a parking lot session where it's like any discussion that didn't get to happen in the previous two webinars can happen in the third one. Um, so yeah, this my understanding is that this is going to be um, allowing a lot of dialogue and yeah. not just Sarah, to Sarah, you. Sarah just sent me a list of all the upcoming webinars today, and she's she's chatting me on the side here. But feel free to chime in, Sarah. Yeah, I was trying not to disrupt the flow of conversation. So that was a long, long uh, process. The department issued, I think, their RFI in July or maybe August of this past year. We spent um, uh, probably six weeks or so communicating and working with the, some of the other DUs to uh, come up with a, a joint response. I believe that we had sent and included, or I had sent and included what our response ended up being to that initial RFI and ultimately the department was asking for questions and feedback on very specific points, specifically whether to create a nine month review process or an 18 month review process. And we strongly supported the longer term process to ensure adequate engagement with various stakeholders throughout the state. But we can, I can circle that back to you um, so that you can see what was submitted, but the, the process is not done nowhere near done. And like I said, there's at least three um, webinar series, some in the mornings during the day and some at night. So there's always, there's a, you know, during the day and an evening session for each of these topics. Two questions, two more questions on it. Is there an opportunity for written comment? And um, if FEPSA supplied written comments, we would like to see them. Yes, I believe that the written comment, you know, the initial RFI piece has has closed. However, that was just the start of the full engagement process. So I would, I, I'm not in the department, but I would say that, yes, the, the opportunity for written comments will continue. And I will send you what we had submitted as part of the board packet, probably over the tail end of the summer. That would be great. Absolutely. Thank you. 
Okay. I think we've got to keep this moving along. It's it's uh, it's it's five forty already, and uh... what I'm hearing is a desire for more information on the res generally. So we'll we'll have to set aside, I think, another time to to really get deep into that. Um, but on the legislative side, again, the last one that I wanted to bring up was Act One Fifty One. Um, this came up a few years ago, so back in twenty twenty. Um, Efficiency Vermont basically requested the ability to divert some of their funds, um, two million to be exact, um, divert two million dollars of EEC funds and use those towards greenhouse gas emissions reductions um, types of projects. Um, that is an area where we get concerned very quickly about uh, about EEC funds funding things other than a benefit that is directly experienced by the electric rate payer. Um, so we participated heavily back in 2020 when that was going through. Basically, our condition was that they could move forward with this as long as the utilities were the ones directing how these funds would be spent. And ultimately, um, the utilities directed Efficiency Vermont that they could do some spending in the thermal sector, especially as it relates to low income households. Um, so we have a, a pilot that's recently launched that is basically funding low income households who have gone through weatherization through the weatherization assistance programs to receive a cold climate heat pump. So it's adding some electrification to these um, to these low income households. The other component is focused more on transportation, um, basically using Efficiency Vermont and their ability to navigate the supply chain to set up networks um, within the uh, auto dealerships to allow them to basically sell EVs and um, you know, have educated salespeople, um, have some infrastructure available at the dealerships um, and receive sales incentives. So that's where Act 151 was in 2020. Now that we're at 2023, um, the energy efficiency utilities, which will be Efficiency Vermont, um, Burlington Electric and VGS are going to be proposing an expansion to Act 151. Another 2 million, another three years to keep doing some of this kind of work. Um, it is highly likely that VEPSA will be speaking up on this topic, that we have concerns about um, equitable distribution of, of these programs across the state, especially within the VEPSA member territories. We want to see those dollars flowing back, and there's there's going to be some argument there about what that looks like. So we will be speaking up pretty um, pretty openly in that process. That is the legislative update that I have. I also have a whole communications memo here. Um, I don't know if you want me to dive into that. Um, up to you. No, I think we ought to give Sarah a few minutes and uh, move along. But we will circle back with you, Julia. No sweat next time or the time after. Sounds great. Thank you, Julia. Thank you very much. Thank you, and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Uh, well, I'm not going to belabor the res points. I will do minor things. The tier three annual plan has been filed. We have some, you know, minor comments to provide back to the commissioner based on their request. Otherwise, that looks good to go. Um, as Julia mentioned, the 2021 compliance was found, uh, it was approved. So we're moving forward there. And as for this past year, the 2022 tier three, these are the prescriptive and custom measures, we have reached in aggregate about double the uh, compliance obligation. So those are all good, good things. We have the initial filing due in March of this year for tier three. And then as is every year, full compliance uh, submitted in August. So you know, more to come there, but otherwise that is going well. We will be launching an online platform for more efficient rebate processing for customers and for businesses and our dealership partners um, tomorrow, actually. It is, is live and we'll be doing some outreach and training as needed so that that is a much more streamlined process and uh, encourages those electrification measures going forward. But that's probably not the most interesting piece of the, <laughs> of the regulatory update. Um, 
I'm sure you all heard and saw all of the fun things that came with Winter Storm Elliot. Um, we suspect based on some of the previous conversations around you know, dist distribution transformers, potential shortages, supply chain delays, all of that, plus you know, the perception that those supply resources hedge on not having enormous storms like were encountered with Winter Storm Elliot. Um, we expect that conversation will continue to be had, that we will continue to field questions on our member utilities' ability to respond not only to volatile storms, but also to the electrification, uh, electrification of thermal and transportation, to be completely honest, with the influx of heat pumps and EVs and EV chargers and residential homes that obviously creates some stress and burden on the utility and the utilities system and capacity. So more to come there, but we are staying in touch with each of our utility members and trying to support where needed and where necessary uh, to make sure the regulators are, are comfortable with where we where our members are. Um, let's see, the, I guess, like I said, the, you know, the transformer survey was submitted in December. Uh, I believe Mike and all, all Mike and all the members received that. In addition, we have heard initially on the AMI infrastructure grant on the Affordable Community Renewable Energy uh, Community Solar Program. That's a state grant that was uh, the RFP was announced uh, several months ago or a few months ago, and we are waiting to hear formal word and announcement there. And there was also in December, the commission's order to respond to EV rates, EV rate design. And this is all in advance of the order for time of use, use rates in 2024. So we have been working with various entities, including the power shift program, which provide is in partnership with Efficiency Vermont. And that uh, helps to incentivize in-home chargers with scheduled charging, essentially, which I believe, Mark, uh, Mike, you've seen emails back and forth on that as well. <laughs> um, I'm sure you are all aware of the rule 4.500 on dam safety. There is a public hearing either this week or I think it's Wednesday, and I have registered for that. But yes. Tomorrow. <laughs> Tomorrow, there we go. Yep. <laughs> And uh, I have registered for that. I will attend and observe, but as far as I understand, Hardwick is in very good hands uh, working with your own teams to, to track that and provide comment. So we are here as support if needed. The other couple pieces, um, the commission has activated its rule two, which is around procedural administration. So those are just some administrative updates based on changes that have been made throughout COVID and they've implemented, you know, more streamlined changes there. So we're monitoring that. There was a training held uh, last week. And also the emergency rule 2.600 on emergency disconnections has expired and all new disconnection notices must be filed by Friday, January 27th. So we are working with all the utilities to file on your behalf if should you decide. Otherwise, we have created a simple template for anyone who doesn't have the capacity to do that. Beth and I have been in conversation there. So uh, I think you all are in good hands as well. That's a lot all at once. <laughs> I'm sure I have not covered every single item, but I want to open that up if there are specific dockets that are of interest or concern at this point. Although it seems like it should be a quiet time of month, it is not, or a quiet time of year, it is not. <laughs> I don't know if the silence is because I threw too much all at once. But... <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I, 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 in my, I, it's not a question, it's just a comment, but again, mm -hmm. to the extent that there are opportunities to comment, and, and, and those typically are, are time sensitive, if we can know about those ahead of time, so that if we do want to 
comment individually or comment when I say individually as, 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 as the board or that we want to um, that we that we actually can do so or 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 have additional input to VEPSA. I know Mike is is speaking, you know, with with VEPSA all the time, but um, on some of these items, we may want to um, have a a position, a policy position taken, and we don't have that opportunity if we only hear about it after the fact. I, I hear that and it is it as you I'm sure are well aware sometimes the time turnaround especially it seems like over the last six weeks six to eight weeks has been you know you have two weeks to comment on x y or z but yeah. I do try at my very best every beginning of the month when we do we have the VEPSA board meeting to provide a snapshot of the deadlines that are coming up for the following month of course yeah, as right. soon as I publish that it ends up having six more new dates added to it between right. the actual meeting. And, but and I, this may, yeah. yeah, this may be more a question, Mike, of, of sending that out to the board when you get it. Yeah, the regulators are really good at giving themselves plenty of time to do their stuff and not much I for know. everybody else. <laughs> okay. Then now, the one has, thing I, I'll, I'll just add, since I know that this was a major um, item of concern and it has, you know, it's been an open docket since 2017 is the re revisions to rule 300, which are, you know, the low income, low income docket disconnection notices and things like that. From what I understand, there may be a ratepayer protection bill coming through the legislature. So I think we are trying to stay on top of that, keep an eye on it and make sure that um, our utilities, our, our members are, are considered our position is considered there and and from what I understand um based on all of the previous work we did in 2022 it is something that we want to ensure if it is a statewide program that it is more socialized and not necessarily through ratepayer funds because that would create more concern but that is you know more certainly to come there that docket is not closed it is potential that the commission is seeking or that the legislature will seek uh, commission authority to implement a rate like that. So we're keeping a close eye on any movement in that regard. And I know that that was a major docket of, of interest and concern, but nothing has been updated in the actual file or the, the case files at this point. And that is all I have there. <laughs> Sarah, thank you very much. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you all. Have a lovely evening. You too. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Okay. The next item on the agenda is Brooke. Hello, Brooke. Hi. Hi. Brooke. How are you all? Good. Doing, doing, doing well. I would like to make a motion. Um, unless, Brooke, is there anything that you want to discuss in open session before we go into executive session? No, thanks. I don't think so. Okay. Um, I would like to move that we go into executive session to discuss a potential litigation matter, the premature disclosure of which would prejudice the interests of Hardwick Electric Department. Second. Is there a second? Second. All, all in favor? Any discussion? Hearing that, all in favor? I think everyone's right. in favor. Um, it is 5.53 p.m. And as soon as the recording is off, we will go into executive session. Thanks. It is 6.48 p.m. And we are out of executive session. No action was taken. So the next item on the agenda is the general manager's report. Yeah. Which is page 20, begins on page 20. So, so Rusty's gonna be the big, the big hot show in Hyde Park? That's what he tells us, yeah. He's gonna, he's going there to 
uh, step into their foreman's role shortly, who's retiring, and then ultimately is going to progress into their superintendent position. This is Morrisville, not not Hyde Park. Correct. Well, Morrisville, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, big job. Yeah. Well, we wish him a lot of luck. Yeah, I totally did. It was a it was a very uh, pleasant parting of ways, and we had a little party for him and wished him all the best. And it isn't like we're not going to work with him in the future. So, good relationship stands. Great. Um, it, reading this report, I think um, we're short of cash, <laughs> or we, we may be very shortly. And so um, your proposal, Mike, is to do a six month line of credit at Union Bank. Um, why six month rather than, than, than a year? Just uh, I've just figured our, our new rates would be in effect within, within that time frame. They'd do a year, they'd a, she would do up to 12 months, she didn't care. I just figure why not do the longer and yeah. and and sure. if, we, if we spend it all in in less we spend it all in less but um, not a problem they'll change that in a heartbeat. Um, but I think I think we need to have a, a motion to um, authorize that. So I yeah, move I to authorize up securing the line of credit uh, and. Uh, recognizing that we, Mike will need signatures, Mike, from all of us. Yes. So yes. conditioned on signatures from all of us on the actual bank documents. Okay. And, right. So and what I've done it, is reached it, out to our commercial municipal lender at the bank, asked her for recommendation. I said, is the best to do a 90 day note or and she said, no, we would typically do a line of credit and uh, this is how we would do it. And so then I talked to Eli about it and because she was talking about well, Mike, having, Mike, 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 we have a, we need a motion and a second right. and then we can discuss it. I'm sorry All right. just so that it doesn't get totally confused. But uh, Roger, were you saying a 12, did you say a 12 month line yeah, of credit? Secure, secure a 12 month line of credit from Union Bank in the amount of $200,000. Okay. Is there second. a second? Okay. Second. Now, Mike, sorry. Sorry, I was just trying to give you the, the events that have transpired, but my my process will land us with a now 12 month instead of six month set of paperwork for you to all review. Uh, and if you agree with it, sign it, and that'll hook us up for a 12 month line of credit for 200,000 bucks. Now at, at 200,000, do we have to get author, because it's less than a year or it's a year or less than we don't need to get Right, pair? No, we don't. Yeah, if it's under a year, we don't need a vote under Section 108. So 12 months or less, we never need a vote. And unless we are doing a quote unquote general um, loan for the, then if we were doing a general loan or bond, then the select board has to sign off with us as well. This is strictly an HED revenue loan or bond and according to Eli and the statute that he provided to the bank and the bank agreed with you all are the only ones who need to sign this okay so it so it sounds like then then we with all you know assuming that everybody's on board about that that we need um just to have some kind of a process for signing it and I don't know if the easiest thing is to have it at HED's office or to, do we need all commissioners to sign? Yeah. Okay. Um, I can run it around. That's not a problem. I can come but in. Whatever's easy for you all. Let's get it and get you to like it first. So we don't have, so, so really we're just voting on having you get the, get the paperwork set up. We're not approving so then we'd have to have another vote to approve it. Yeah, that's what I figured. I'd bring everything to the next month's meeting. Do are we good till the next month? Yes. You're sure we won't. We're yeah. not going to have. We're, we're good. looking at Beth, and she's nodding. 
As long as we don't get another Christmas storm. Right. No more storms. That would not be good. Good article in the Gazette. Did you write it, Mike? No, I didn't see it. Oh, that very good great. article. It, well, I was surprised to see it. It's what I sent as a, well, except that the language about that we had talked about, Mike, didn't, sh that's, that's, that's digressing. We can, um, but yeah, the language about the qualifier on the customers who didn't bother to, you know, we didn't know about. Yeah. Um, but that was, and I didn't know it was going to be in because I got no response when I sent it. <laughs> and then it, it didn't show up as a letter. It just showed up as this article. Huh. So. Um, Good. Yeah, good. Good press. Good picture. Um, so spe speaking of cash, uh, what's the status of that wheeling tariff? I mean, that seems like- We're, we're not talking about the wheeling tariff right now. We're talking about whether we should get a line of credit. Oh, okay. I thought that was done. Everybody. No, no. We're talking okay. about whether- we're, That's the motion that's on the table. Yeah, that's what okay. we're discussing right now. <laughs> I and, get so excited about the money. <laughs> I get. I guess. All right. So, do we need? Uh, we don't need a motion to authorize Mike then to 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 go and get the forms. If we're going, no. But we can just ask him to get the forms and um, as quickly as possible, so that we have time to look at them um, in advance. And and I would say get Mike comments. We can't circulate comments amongst ourselves because that's a meeting, but we can send comments to Mike so that if there are things that are of concern, because my, my concern is, is that if we wait till the next meeting to discuss it and then it has to go through again, that it's gonna be later and we start really. I'm not so gonna the, bank, the bank committed to have the documents to me by this Friday. Okay. Line of credit. It takes them so long. They should have, they should be form documents. That's my guess. Yeah. The issue was that the, the borrowing based on only our revenues is not what they normally do. They usually do it on the full and uh, full and what's the other word? Credit, of the, credit town. of the town. Yeah. But this is different. So they're having it written up separate. I see. Okay. Um, So then I, I think I think a motion right now is premature then, it sounds like, if we're not going to authorize it. So Roger, would you care to withdraw your motion? I will withdraw my motion. <laughs> second. Um, <laughs> it doesn't need a second. Um, Are there any other comments or questions about the general manager's report? What's what's our peak demand now, Mike? Is it like six megawatts? Uh, about six point nine. And these guys think they're going to add another three megawatts. These two new users. Yeah, I mean, yellow barn. That's a crazy. I don't know what the EV is. I know the yellow barn can't be one and a half megawatts. That's just crazy. No, I know it's it's what absurd. Are they, are they smelting in there it's, or something? Uh, yeah, it's I know. cold storage. So I, I had a good conversation with Eric about this and I reminded, or I told him the story of the uh, Highland Arts Center, yep. uh, putting that massive service in there and they paid to upgrade the line from Hardwick substation all the way up there. And they use about 10% of what they paid for. It was absolutely nuts. And I wow. told him, you know, you, that's the same equation you're looking at here. You're gonna have something you do not need. Yeah. I'm sorry, Roger, you said, what was it? Cold storage, you said? Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah. A lot That's of cheese. Still... Cheese. Cheese. Jasper That's... Sellers, Jasper Sellers is the, the, I think they're using over two thirds of the building for cheese storage. Uh, the remaining is, you know, electrical room, et cetera, et cetera. And then the food venture is putting a new uh, kitchen facility over there they're expanding and moving into that building as well as where they are now i mean how much does the cheese storage that they have at food venture and at and and greensboro pull now right so i i told them that i said if i give you the total entire jasper sellers <laughs> operation peak capacity and add that uh add to that 
the peak capacity needed at the existing food venture, that's less than one third of what you're asking for. <laughs> so that's called over engineering, right, Mike? Yeah. Oh, for that's sure. <laughs> Yeah. Well, look, yeah. that sounds like the right course of action because it's a win-win. It's a win for them. And then, because my God, with this kind of opportunity for the community and for Hardwick Electric to get increased demand like this, we can't tell people, no, you got to go somewhere else. Right. What's, We're what's way this? better off managing it down to something we can say yes to or yeah. do in their timeline. They have to build the building too. So we don't have to be super speedy but we got to right, be right. as speedy as well, but the, the, the big issue and, and the big concern for them right now believe it or not is the most expensive uh or pardon me the longest lead time items are all the electrical components for the facility including our stuff so there i think they're awarding that bid this coming thursday or friday and the first thing they need to do is order that the whoever they award it to needs to order all this electrical equipment. So yeah, they're going to be building, but they're still going to be waiting for electrical stuff but, even after the building's up. But, but what's their what's the lead? I'm asking about the lead time for two two reasons. One is, you know, for example, are we going to need to put in transformers, and the lead time on that is long. So <laughs> that strikes me as something that we need to be. Well, I've I've committed to them this transformer that will give them one third of what they're asking for. We have it in stock. It's a brand new unit. It's ready to go. I said, we won't hold you up if you lock in and say this will satisfy your needs. So do otherwise, we need to transformers right now in that size class are up to 144 weeks lead time. 144 weeks. Yep. <laughs> That's almost three years. Yep, that's correct. Jeez. Maybe I should go into the transformer manufacturing business. You should um, invest in it. Build them in the yellow barn. Um, <laughs> and then Lamoil. So, so are you ordering then another one so that we will have one? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if they, if they lock it us in. We would need, might need it for something. Yeah. yeah um, if they lock in for that one, I will. I will actually probably find one at another utility and pick it up and replace their inventory. What are the ramifications of these two projects and, and when um, in terms of not just, just the electrical work that we have to do, but, but on their um, consumption that we have to purchase the power for them. Right. Um, and, and presumably this is not, stuff that we're, we've already committed. This is this is way bigger than our- Our, our, our fudge, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, uh, I don't know what Lamoille's gonna do. They're gonna do something. They've made that pretty clear. Um, and I don't know how big or what the minimum size is they need to meet to get their criteria, but they're gonna be doing something. And well, it said, uh, it said one and a half megawatts. Yes. But I don't know if they could do a 500 kW installation and meet the criteria for their uh, sta uh, their status with Ford. I'm not sure what that requirement is. Well, I, I think there are two issues probably for them. One is their status with Ford, and the other is their status with their customers. Because, you know, if if they're fine with Ford, but but uh, but but their customers are saying, "Hey, we can't get our stuff, ch you know, charged." Um, it it's not gonna it's not gonna serve their yeah, their interest. But even at 500 kilowatts, depending upon you know the load factor, 500 we could handle with the uh, with the 300 for the yellow barn. That would put us right at peak on that transformer because it's not really. I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the electrical capacity. Oh, okay. I'm talking about how much additional energy we have to purchase. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, until they nail down what they want from us, which will be this week on the Yellow Barn. And whenever the scope of the project is nailed down with uh, Lamoille, I'd be guessing. Any but I mean, but it, they're it, gonna it, be it, significant. It's gonna be yeah. significant. Yes. And, and, and I think it probably behooves us to be looking at More. alternatives. 
So anyhow, I just wanted to note that because it yep. struck me when I was reading this. Anything else? It's not like uh, that question I had before regarding the uh, wheeling tariff. Is there any update on that? So that is a 100% Steve Farman's wheelhouse item. And he has backburnered it the last probably three months because he's been doing rate cases, but uh, not that's any excuse or anything, but that's where it's at. Okay, so and is uh, be able to, would the charges be retro, retroactive to the beginning of transmission? No. No, nope. so we're losing no money going into effect then. The okay. other thing is, Vince, strategically, um, I was okay with uh, delaying on that because that could have been a factor in our rate case. I'd rather have those revenues come in later. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now it's time to light a fire. <laughs> well, once we get our new rates, right? It, yeah. yeah, in terms of 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 rate. If people saw that Stowe is in for another rate yeah. increase. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I can tell you anecdotally with uh, um, heat pump installation, uh, like our electric use has gone from 600 kilowatt hours a month to over 3,000 in the winter. And I mean, that you, you know, you have 50 to 100 of those, and it's actually quite a big demand. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that takes us then to the financial statements. Are there any questions or comments there? I guess one question that I have is what is our cash on hand? I mean, cause this is back in November and we're sitting in the middle of January right now. <laughs> Um, I actually looked at it through December, um, and through as of the end of December, we were over three hundred thousand. Okay. Good. So having two months where we're not depleting it really puts us. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that helps. Okay. Any... Christmas, Christmas was expensive. Yeah. 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 Could have been a lot worse. I'm pretty happy. But that's not that's not in your that's not in. But we haven't paid for all of that, so that's not in the December numbers. Correct. Right. So we're, well, we don't have the December numbers yet. Right, but but you were saying the cash was through the end of December. Oh well, I can, I can look in the computer interactively and see where our cash was as of the end of December after we had paid bills. Right, but we that. wouldn't have paid. But we wouldn't have paid the Christmas bills yet. Yeah, the vast uh, majority most of them, the vast majority of our expense is going to be in the labor which was spent and that <laughs> was paid I mean, labor and materials were paid and were paid in 20 in december yeah. yes you guys get paid every two weeks i think don't they one week one week every week wow. yeah and the, the reason it was driven up so high lynn was because of the holiday and the weekend oh yeah no it was, it was crazy overtime yeah. Um, how does that work, Mike? So they get they get double time or double more than double time, or how, does it? So they get they get double. It all equates to double time and a half for work. Double time on and a half. Yeah. It's nice. <laughs> hey, listen, bless them. They uh, earned it. Darn right. It was miserable and dangerous and that's um and some of the other utilities did nowhere as near as well correct i couldn't have been prouder of our guys they, they rocked it were were was was our team on their own, or were there people from from out of? I mean, I know that there were Massachusetts crews in Stowe with the Stowe guys. No, all we had was our operation staff and me, and A and B tree service. Okay, I did get uh, this was this was this uh, call from uh, the person who had the power line down over their their driveway that you took care of. Um, <clears throat> 
and I think just generally, uh, I think we are not doing a good job of getting our story out. I mean, for example, in Stowe, which had, and I, I use this only because, not to compare us to Stowe, but because I had the information. Stowe Electric has a Facebook page. I think they're on Instagram and other things too, but I don't do those, but I could see on their Facebook page and they were giving regular updates to let people know what was going on. Um, I think as a result of that on Front Porch Forum, there were people commenting on the Facebook page, Front Porch Forum, I don't know how many, there were tons and tons of comments on Front Porch Forum you know, from customers saying how grateful they were and how terrific the crews were. And, you know, it, 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 it's, they're doing a much better job than we do of getting the story out. I mean, Everybody. so it, it was, it was very immediate, but, you know, Stowe Electric were heroes. Um, and, I heard a lot of um, compliments in Greensboro. Yeah, we got a lot of letters. We got pictures, we got cakes sent to us. But you're right. We didn't do it via Facebook or uh, social media. Well, it's good to know that that it it's because you know again people were donating food and feeding the guys and it. I just think we could, and I I think we are missing the boat by not having um, a presence on Facebook. I hate Facebook. I don't. I don't. I'm not a big fan of it. I, I don't. I, but, but lots of people are on Facebook and they get their information on Facebook. Right. And, you know, the alternative is, 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 is having a much more active website. And I think that's much more difficult than, um, than having something on Facebook that could be, you know, updated in situations like that. Because people want information, you know, if people know what's going on, it's like when you're, you know, your, your flight was delayed, you don't get there any faster, whether they tell you or not why the flight's delayed, but it makes it a little bit easier to tolerate. At least for me, that's my sense, if I know what's going on, and I think a lot of people react that way. Um, we've got a, we've got a great story to tell, and we're not, and we're not, uh, and we're not telling it. And um, I, th I think, it's, you know, especially what rates going up um, and we don't know what's going to happen in another six months or a year, you know, um, I, I think it's important to have that kind of goodwill. Um, you know, there I think are things I, that people can get pissed I off completely, at. I completely agree with your perspective, uh, Lynn, that we, we, I, I agree with Nat. I can't stand Facebook or social media, but I'm not our customer base, and our customer base, our customer base does use it, does want it. You know. That being said, I know for a fact that Stowe has a full time employee that does all that stuff for them. Right. That I'm out with the crews for the last three hours. It's now ten o'clock at night, and. I do run into the office and I update the outage site and do what we have, but there's a lot of room for improvement. But maybe, I, maybe on something like that, that one of the people who works in the office could be doing the update. You phone it in and, and they're doing, you know, in other words, we, you don't have to be doing it. Um, and, understood. And maybe, but then if we, if we extrapolate on that, okay, so now we go three months without a storm and our stuff gets out of date because we don't have somebody designated doing I'm just saying it's not as simple as saying, yeah, we're going to use Facebook now. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I think it's a good idea. I think it's something we should be doing, but I don't know how best we implement that. It's, it's hard to do in-house. I can tell you, we had a publicist that got our stuff in the yeah, New York Times you everywhere, but that was his job. That's what he did. Yeah. He was an outside consultant, but Getting someone to do it in-house, it's really good for about three months. And after that, it's kind of weeds itself away and you find out you're not doing it anymore. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I hear what you're saying and it, it's a lot of it's scale and well, capacity limitations with the size of Hardwick Electric. But I'm on another board, a National Scenic Trail Board and they have an internal communications person and they have, it's usually updated and very current and very active. and 
So, I mean, so I think it can be as long as somebody is specifically designated. It's, well, it's I, I'm going to, I think it would be a, a better solution for us would be for me to broach this topic at a BEPSA board meeting and see if this is something we could have Julia babysit our Facebook pages for us. You know, that, I mean, this is the kind of stuff she does and she loves it, right. eats it and breeds it. <clears throat> so if we needed her 10 hours a year or something, I don't know. I, I think that would be a better route for us at this point, but I'm not sure. Well, it's certainly better than where we're at. Yeah. So I, I think it's, you know, if, if, if given our staffing, if that's how we can manage it, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with trying it that way. But what I hear, you know, people want, so long as she knows our customers and knows, you know, I mean, the difficulty of having someone who isn't Hardwick Electric, which is also, you know, because our emergency folks aren't, and we're not, you know, people are not talking to a person, they're getting, they're leaving messages on a system, which is, you know, again, I think part of the reason that we went to the system was so that people could talk to a person. And I know it was a, the storm was very widespread in this case, but, you know, the, the frustration that I was hearing was that when people called, they weren't able to talk to a person. Um, and again, I know that Stowe Electric had somebody in the office you know, through, I don't know how long, but for a lot of that time and process. And maybe that's something that we should be thinking about. Um, so are, are you talking this, about like what you're saying, you're talking about emergency information or general yeah. engagement? Well, this was, this, was, this was a person who called, they had a line down over their, their driveway. They had power, it was flickering, but they had power. Uh, but the thing was sparking and there was a tree over it. And so they were stuck in their house. And so they called the number and there wasn't really an option for their situation because they had power, but the tree was, so they took the closest thing, which was something like the, there's a tree down or there's a line down <coughs> and, and you don't have power. So there wasn't an option that there's a line down with the tree and you do have power. And so what happened was that she would then get a message an hour later saying, we're so glad your power has been restored, but they still were stuck with the line down. And this went on several times after, and she called me. You know, she must've gone on the website and picked up a name and found my phone number and, and called me. And then I called Mike and, and Mike was heading up that way anyway. And apparently she was in the system but she had no way of knowing that yeah. because she kept getting calls back telling her that she was restored. Maybe it's a case of having, you know, a different thing, or if you don't fall in any of the pockets that you can talk to somebody. Well, actually there's a little more to this story that you're not aware of. Uh, no. CRC, the call center that we use, uh, fell on its face because they were handling storms from uh, Washington State to Houston, Texas, to the state of Maine. And every one of their customers within that arena was clobbered. And they were completely overwhelmed. Their systems were overwhelmed. They even branched out to the Atlanta call center. <clears throat> so they were begging customers such as us to, hey, take your storm and run with it. We can't, you know, we can't take these calls. But well, I had already taken over our storm at that point. So we did the thing they wanted everybody to do. All I wanted them to provide for us was answer the calls, get my customer's information into the system and I'll deal with it. So that's why when you called Lynn, I knew, you know, I'd seen that customer's name and she was on my to-do list. That's like I was headed to Grassberry, but that, that was another part of why things landed the way they did. Yeah, no, I, I, and I, I, you had told me, and I know that, that the systems were overwhelmed, um, but again, mm -hmm. this was a case, this was the one that I heard about. You know, yeah. we don't know about the ones that we didn't hear about. But th this is a perfect piece of information that if we did have a Facebook page, I could say, hey, Arctic Electric is aware of outages in this town, this town, this town, this town, and this town. The call center is overwhelmed you know, exactly. be advised, exactly. yeah, that kind of thing. 
exactly. So, okay. So my takeaway is I'm going to investigate incorporating Julia into our maybe a pilot solution to this. See how that goes. Because I really do agree with you, Mike, that this is it's a full-time job. And if you want somebody to, I, I'm not one to uh, under commit and over deliver. I always want to over commit. Uh, am I saying that right? I want to over deliver. Over deliver and under commit. Yeah. So I don't want to do it and do it half ass. That's basically what I'm saying. If I want to do it, let's do it and do it right. Well, plan your dive and dive your plan. Thank you. <laughs> But, but I don't think we should let perfect be the enemy of good. No. Yeah, no, I agree with that. Okay. Okay. Um, Moving on. <laughs> enough, anything else on the financial statements? Uh, Mike, One quick question. Okay. Billings Road, uh, the total cost was 40% higher because we had 14% higher generation. Is that just a direct correlation? Wait, where, if we get more where, out of where, it, we pay more. I'm sorry. You, Page 23. Cost increases. That it's a H11 is a cost decreaser, Mike. Once it goes through the full equation, and I've had this discussion with Sean multiple times. I don't know why he and Sarah always refer to it as an increaser. It's not. It's a decreaser. Because yeah, for the month we did okay, even though all the costs went up. Yeah. We're in the budget. But they don't, I mean, those numbers he has right there don't include the recs, which don't come until two months from then, from those yeah. numbers. So no, but he reports on recs and they calculate the recs and they account for recs separately. But they're all part of the H11 in my book. I, th I think that I think it's important to have them consolidated for H11, regardless of how BEPSA manages their power purchases and rec purchases, because Understood. that's that's why we did this. <laughs> yeah. I'll get that straightened out. <clears throat> Anything else before we move on? Okay, um, so Mike, you said uh, there's a joint, you want to talk about joint meeting with the select board? Yes, so uh, Opie and I have been talking uh, quite a bit about the topics that we, we as the town manager and the HED general manager would like to have you all talk about. I mean, you, you guys have the stuff you'd like to talk about and they have theirs, but we, the two of us have a couple of things too. Um, one of those is the board of commissioners and select board relationship and how we all are built under the, the scope of the municipal corporation. And I'd really like to get a on the table discussion about that. And I was uh, going to share the document I created for all of you. I don't know if you remember it with that pie chart showing, you know, here's the portion of the corporation that's this, here's the portion that's HED. And I gave the history of the merger of the village of the town. And it was just information. Um, and I wanted to get your okay to share that with Eric before the meeting, if that's a, po if that's a topic you guys are okay with broaching. The other one is uh, we got a, and I'm pretty sure you're aware of this one, but we got a, tax bill for our property in our plant and service in Hardwick. That's 200 plus percent, Beth, is that correct? Yeah. Of what it was it the previous year. Um, and we are, as part of the corporation of the town of Hardwick, we are exempt from paying them tax. That said, the select board and the Hardwick Electric Board of Commissioners created this pilot program, payment in lieu of taxes, some many, many years ago. And the boards agreed that this would be done 
the board members, all the select board members signed it, all the HD board members signed it. And that has expired and fallen out of time, but carried on the same process for many years after that expiration. And now that we're looking at a, you know, a 200 plus thousand dollar bill instead of a hundred, I think we need a new agreement. And, you know, I'm not really okay with with a lower number. Do they have do they have a formula that's pre-agreed or is it a unilateral we can double and that's just how it works? They use they read the this agreement that I saw, there isn't a detailed agreement, but what so there's they no use agreement was in the, place right now. Right. Okay. Yeah. So we've just, they've been they've been billing us the pilot based on the old thing and we've yeah. been paying that. Yep. But we've, yep. but we've nobody's been argued about it and that's been fine. Um, but now it's gone up a hundred percent. I mean, it's a significant amount of money. It's a significant increase to just bill us for. It's not in our budget. So could we, could, do you have the option, you know, there's two things is to blow everything up or to say, we'll, we'll, we, this has been in place. We'll continue to pay it as it's been in place, but not the doubling. If, if you want to pursue the doubling, the agreement is now dissolved and we'll have to meet at the negotiating table. What, so what I was told, the basis I spoke, the I tracked down, the, I'm sorry, go ahead. What was the basis for the doubling? Oh, so the Department of Taxes executes a formula based on legislation and they take our annual plant and service inventory sheets so we say we have x number of miles of three phase distribution circuits we have x mile y miles of single phase distribution circuits we have this many transformers and all, and all that as many poles and that all goes through a spreadsheet that pukes out a number uh, that is the basis for our taxes for our, our our dollars of value that then the town is told by the tax department here is the value but, our, but but on our books, it's all depreciated. It's gone down in value, yeah. not up in value. Well, yeah, and I've talked to the tax department and the maximum depreciation they put into the form is 18%, which I said is ridiculous. We, we depreciate our stuff to zero over 30 years. I mean, I have, I have plenty of stuff out there that's way beyond 18%. They don't care. Yeah. They said, well, you got to take it up with the legislature. We can't help you. But, 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 we're but not go bound. back to your original, your original comment was they have, because we're a part of the town, they really don't have a right to tax us, so. Well, now you're changing gears from the tax department, department of taxes to the town, and that's correct. We are exempt from paying tax to the town. Every other town that we're in, we have to pay. Does, does land wind up in there, Mike? Uh, land is, specifically excluded or real property is limited to only the non-developed value of the property. So for example, we have a hydro facility in the town of Woka that's worth tens of millions of dollars. None of that comes into the equation. They can only tax us on the acreage that we have as though there was nothing there. Weird. So the, the pilot, the pilot, program contract agreement uh, that had a specific number or was there a formula? I mean, was there? So all they did Vince was they took the same number from the, the same process from the tax department, got a value. And when that pilot was agreement was made, uh, it was treated as though Hardwick Electric had a house worth X number of dollars, just like Joe Smith down the street had a house worth X number of dollars and you got taxed the same. There was no benefit to Hardwick Electric. We were paying full price, whether we were Washington Electric with a line in this town or Hardwick Electric, it was exempt. But the question of the formula is how did it double? The formula or the number doubled because there are two things, as I recall, Beth, help me if you can. But I think there was an error in the formula, one of the formulas, and 
Uh, it hadn't been updated since 2006 or something. Does that sound right, Beth? It was long very time, long, long time. time since it had been updated. So also, uh, I went back and um, Brian gave me the last or the several of the previous uh, town clerks. And one of them is still alive and local. And I contacted that person and talked to them about, hey, you know, was there a pilot there with the town then? And he said, absolutely not. He says the, the, the perspective back then was why would we tax ourselves? All it's gonna do is raise our, raise our rates. And, you know, ultimately that's true, but that perspective for who knows what, maybe hard, the town of Hardwick was uh, hard up for money that year that this was signed, or I have no idea, but I, I'll be happy to forward along the documents that Opie shared with me, but there's not a lot of documentation other than this signed page saying that the pilot as, as uh, I can't even remember what it says, but everybody signed it and I'll be happy to forward it to you. <laughs> So anyway, those are two things that I could really use your help on getting closed out. Well, and it sounds like this is a discussion that has to be had with the select board on both of these. Yeah. Yeah. And, and within us, too. Were there particular issues on, on the um, relationship? I mean, my sense is that it's gotten better. Um, yeah. Yes, I think it has. But for example, Lynn. Uh, Eric came in to my office the other day wanting to talk about the Yellow Barn project. Mm -hmm. And um, so when you or anybody else, the town or Beth or Joe comes in and they want a new service or a line extension, they have to fill out the right paperwork. They have to pay a $250 fee that pays for uh, a site visit to be executed that pays for us to work up an estimate that pays for us to go out to bid for transformers and do our work to say okay yeah here we can do your project for a dollar uh here's the estimate uh it's good for one year and here you go well it had been two years since the town had paid their 250 dollar fee so i said yeah as soon as you're whoever needs to pay the new fee and we can work up a new pricing, you know, based on what you tell us, we'll be ready to go. And he was having some real heartburn over the second $250 fee. And he says, well, we own you. We own you. And I'm so sick of hearing we own you. That's it's just wrong, you know, and it needs to be straightened out. And I'm, I'm just done with it. It's a, it's an ongoing creation of conflict that, you two boards need to lay out once and for all. But yeah. I mean, first of all, what it's why happen. is the town paying for the for, for it? Isn't isn't is the town going to own the building or who's going to own the, the building? Town own the town is going to own it all. Yes, they, they own it now. So the it, there's not going to be a separate corporation. They're not selling it to any. The town is just going to own it and lease it out. That's yep. an interesting approach because <clears throat> the town is in the real estate business. I don't know what the business they're in, but that's what they're doing. <laughs> okay. And did the town own it back when the first study was done? I think the town, I know the town bought the yellow barn from whoever it is, Nat, that owns the Greensboro garage that's next door to you now. Who's that's that? Tim. No, I think they bought it from Tim Nisbet and Steve. Nisbet. That's right. Yep. But he doesn't own the one down the street from me. Yeah. So the town bought it from him with aspirations of creating a welcome center or something. And now uh, the plan that actually I believe they are contracted with Cabot Creamery, that's going to be Cabot Creamery's uh, retail store. They're like big, you know, sales place for their product <clears throat> in the retail market. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the discuss. You know, I think it's something that we do need to clear the air on. I mean, the when it's a question of the town being a customer, they're a customer like every other customer. It's a that's what I tried to tell them. Yeah, it's a little schizophrenic, but we we incur expenses for this. Uh, they they pay electric bills. Yeah, once once he once. 
we chatted it out, he was fine, but <laughs> we had to, we had to get there and that's a step we shouldn't have to take or go through because he could have walked away all bent out of shape and, you know, for no good reason. Yeah. Well, good job taking it at the moment and, and sort of working yeah. it through to understanding. That's good. I mean, it is regrettable that it needed to be done, but. Yeah. Um, no, I think those are both topics that uh, bear discussing. So when do we do this? <laughs> yeah, that's my next question. When should I propose? Because I'm going to propose uh, a date or two this Thursday mm -hmm. when I'm with them. <laughs> well, they're going to want it to be on one of one of are last they time we got the last two regular? times i'm sorry yeah, the last two times we got together they came to us on, or the, we did it on a monday so if we propose one monday and one thursday that i think would be more than fair well i mean it's, is it going to be at one of our regular meetings or is it going to be a separate meeting sounds separate. to me like it should be a separate meeting i mean i, I mean, think so Yes. I mean, do we really meeting. want to get into, you know, the police report and the <laughs> water department yeah. and all of that? I, I just. My reaction is to be relatively tough on this tax issue. I mean, we have a financial problem. Yeah. We'll start low and well in terms of thursdays i have i don't know how quickly we're going to be able to do this but i have i have i'm not available on the 2nd of february or the 9th of march i'm assuming we're going to do this in the evening um oh I mean, they have their regular meetings on Thursdays, every other Thursday, so they don't want to go on those. But it, I don't know which of the every other ones, so. They do the first and third Thursdays of the month. Yeah. So the 16th would be a regular for them. The 9th would be one to propose, I would think. But you're yeah, but I can't, I can't make it. No. I can't make it. I have, I have another board meeting that night. 23rd? The 23rd. I'm just going to be very this is the 23rd of which month? I'm in February. Yeah. I'm oh, we're in February. I thought you we were in March. Sorry. In Fe March in is better. Yeah, March is fine too. Yeah. But I've got I've got two Thursdays that that don't work for me, the 9th and the 23rd. Actually, or, or the 30th. Which month March. are you in now? March. So the only Thursday that would work for me are the Thursdays in March that work are the first or the third, or the second and the 16th. Okay, so let's go back and just propose a couple of Mondays. Okay, Monday, uh, the 6th does not work for me. The 6th of February. Of, of March. 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 But the 13th or the 20th or the 27th. No, don't hit the third. <laughs> Oh, we're right. We're the right. We're the we're the twenty seventh. We're the twentieth. So right. let's do the sixth. The thirteenth or the twenty seventh. The thirteenth. Or you know, I don't know. Maybe a Tuesday or a Wednesday night. I don't know what people's calendars look like, but I'm. I'm retired. I just I'm, want to propose something. They can counter. I mean, I can do every Tuesday and Wednesday except for the twenty eighth. And anyway, if I had to do the 28th or the 23rd, I could. I'm just going to be tired. It's it's the I will have been outside all day at uh, the state Nordic Championships. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So were you talking about March or February? March. March. Okay. So does everybody like Tuesdays and Wednesdays? I don't care. Now that far out, I just can't tell if I'll be traveling. Or yeah, not. me neither. Yeah. Well, Go what ahead. about what about February? Hey, what you give it done? 
No, I mean, I, I just have no idea. So, How far out can you see, Roger? About a week. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, well, let me, I'll ask them to propose some dates and we'll see what we can come up with. How's that? That's even better. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Don't worry, easy. Just give us about six, seven dates. Yeah, I'll ask him to propose two dates uh, on Tuesdays or Wednesdays. Is that good? Yep. It's fine. Uh, yeah, March 1st, Wednesday. I'm not, I've got. Me. Okay, I got that noted. Perfect. Oh. Oh good lord. I put those in those dates that I had on the on the on the were in the wrong months. <laughs> yeah, just see what they say. Okay. Let's go. Yeah, I've got another call, so we gotta keep moving. All right. Um Mike, can you make um oh you did. So I'll be able to, uh, so what do I have to do for the recording and for the? I think really all I'm going to need is the time you go into executive session. Who, if you want to write it down, who made the motion, who seconded it, and what time you came out, and what time you end the meeting, and who made that motion, who seconded it. Other than that, we'll just tack it to this. Yeah. Alternately, you're the co-host now, so you can record what's left and just send. Yeah, it no. Out. What I'm what I'm asking is, how do I so I can just shut off the? How do I shut off the recording? Oh, right at the bottom of the screen. Oh, there uh, it is. Where it says record. On the right, it says you can pause or stop recording. Record yeah. on this. Do I record to the cloud? Well, it doesn't no, say. It doesn't either. let me not record. I'm just looking at what's at the bottom of my screen. Right. And it, has was record. You. it has record on this computer, record to the cloud. It doesn't have don't record. Right. You're, when you record, you're going to want to record to your computer. Then how are you going to get the recording? You can send it to the cloud and get it to me. That's what Beth and I do. Or I can give you a USB stick and you can dump it on there and I can take it. Tell you what. Vince, can you can you make Vince the co-host? Sure. Because he knows how to do this. Perfect. And I don't. If, if I can remember. <laughs> well, because I'm just I'm just looking at this and, and I don't see any way to stop the recording. Okay. Maybe you do. Co-host. Okay. Let me look. I bet I have to stop recording for you to start. Which hey, means everybody, everybody be quiet. Don't say anything. Are they going to be two separate recordings then, or is it going to be continuous? No, okay. yours will be a new one. Okay, and then you just take care of the yours. Okay. I'll take care of mine, and then you ship me yours, and we'll be good. Okay. So I'm going to stop. You should start. Okay. It is 8.19 p.m., um, and um, we are back out of executive session. Um, hmm. I don't know how to say, I mean, we, we, we haven't, we have had a, um, I guess we need to, do we need to have a vote now? To accept the no. results. Yeah, because we we can't take action in in executive session. So um, we could vote no, to should... approve the report. Is that yes. what we would do? Yes. Um, so, do you want to make a motion that to approve the evaluation that we discussed? Okay. So we're. You want me to do it? Sure, you do it. 
Uh, I move that we approve the evaluation that we discussed in executive session. Second. Okay, second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So uh, the evaluation is approved. We'll sign it later. Yeah. Nat, Nat will deliver it. Nat will deliver it. And I um, uh, move to is there, <laughs> is there any other business? Is there I a motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Is there a second? Oh, second. yeah. Okay. All in favor? Yes. Everyone is in favor. We are adjourned at 8.21 p.m. And Vince, if you would please do your magic and send. Yeah, we'll see what happens when you hit end. <laughs> okay, see you okay. all. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.